there is a lot of people that just show stuff and spend basically everything to show stuff, right? Yeah. You cannot understand that just looking at social media. They had like eight cameras in every point where you could cross the street or at every, you know, red light or green light, eight, six, ten cameras, whatever. But when you bring the intangible, i.e. the thoughts, into the tangible on paper, your brain emotionally processes that differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we did the pot. Uh, we did the podcast with Mark, and he talked with us also about you. And we were looking forward to to connect and do another podcast with you. Yeah, but yeah. He had he had some very good things to say. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Uh, how did you how did you meet him? Yeah. Oh, I met him. I actually came through one of his students at the time. So this was 2018 April. Okay. I'd left college about two years before this. So in the, in the UK, you go colleges between the ages of 16 and 18 years old. And okay. I'd left college at that time. So I came across one of his students and I, I'd never seen charts that clean in my life. So I was like, uh, how do you trade? And he said, uh, we do Elliott Wave. I was like, oh, I've heard of this. It's pretty boring. But then I kept following him. And then through time, I was like, this is not Elliott Wave. This is something different. So as I followed him more and more, I got introduced and I tried it for a month. I had mm -hmm. no job, no savings, no money. I used to play badminton and I used to I used to actually fight competitively at pretty high level as well uh, in kickboxing so uh, I earned a little bit of money through that but all of that got blown in the live account so okay of, from 14 15 16 17 and 18 years old all the money I'd accumulated gone within two days so that's uh, crazy really that's crazy honestly I, okay how did you feel like back then I felt thrilled I mean the first time it happened it was horrible but I'd got a taste of what it feels like to to trade the financial markets and how erratic and how volatile things are and how you can quickly you can make money but also lose it as well. So I, I looked at this and thought, right, I like, I've always liked volatile things, always since I was yeah. a young age. So I got involved and prior to this, this is not what not many people know is that I was already self-taught for two years before even really? touching Falcon. Yeah. Okay. So I didn't have money to get courses. So I would go all over the internet and try and find different programs or whatever. I learned absolutely nothing or a lot about nothing in two years, yeah. let's mm -hmm. put it that way. So when I actually finally found Falcon, I was like, at the time it was uh, 57 pound a month, not 97. All right. And that to me was surprisingly cheap and something felt a little bit off. I was like, this is too cheap. So I tried it and the first month in, just the professionalism hooked me in straight away. It okay. was just Mark at the time. There was nobody else in terms of like coaches or anything like that. And um, yeah, we started from then and never stopped since. Amazing. That's actually... Five years almost. So you actually understood, you know, when you when you try to get your first money from trading and everything is moving so fast, it's very volatile. You understood that yeah. there was the possibility, you know, to make money fast, but also lose it fast. And how was that process? You know, for me, it was really difficult to, to go from actually, you know, gambling, basically going randomly and then actually understanding the importance of risk management, the importance of, you know, slow gains that you only you know you starting about percentages and everything changes how was that process how what changed in your mentality oh well, for a fact i mean i i initially looked at things uh, everything monetarily so i thought everything is about pound dollars and that's it just you start with a thousand dollar account right. and you can potentially flip that or scale it but obviously it's the first time i'd heard about somebody tracking their monetary returns in terms of percentage return so that was new to me. And secondly, it was the first time I got introduced to acquiring capital through investors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was no prop firms at the time or that were evident at the time anyway that I knew of. And so the only way in my mind, initially, I thought, well, I'm either going to have to save two, three, four, five thousand pounds and scale that up. But then these guys are talking about making 10% a month. That's only 500 pounds a month. So how is that going to work? I need at least 100,000 pounds. How can I get access to that? And then that's when Mark introduced me to investor capital. So there's a set way to do it. Obviously, it differentiates depending on what country that you're in. But in the yeah. UK, we use a loan contract agreement to actually set that up. And um, I said to him, I've got no network. How am I going to find an investor? Where am I going to go? And all he said to me was, become the asset and the money will follow. That's great. And he just okay. and he stuck with me. And it was so weird how all I did was I, I, I let go of this, uh, putting it on a pedestal, trying to get investor capital or whatever. And six months later, an investor came through. And funnily enough, how it came through, how it came through, my dad does like refrigeration and stuff like that. So he goes to different people's okay. houses, does repairs. And he just came across this random guy who happened to be in the industry of finance, who happened to have wanting to look for a young individual 
<laughs> a young prospect that he could invest money with. So he called me over and um, it was a £75,000 investment and we'd set it to a drawdown of 10%. Okay. And I blew nine trades back to back from the first time I started it. Really? And that Oof. was my first introduction to trading. Really? So, well, you actually, <laughs> so you actually found the investor, but then you were like, welcome, welcome to the, welcome exactly. to this experience. Yeah. Cause so, he said to me, he goes, I will start you in a small amount of capital. Mm -hmm. I was asking for a hundred thousand initially. And he said, I'll start you with 75. Show me what you can do. And I was proper hyping myself up and everything and saying, I can do this and do that. I was promising him 15% at the end of 12 months. The remaining I keep. So okay. that was the agreement that we set. Okay. So in my mind, I'm projecting I'm making 150% at the end of the year. Sure. I'm rich sure. in my mind. Yeah, yeah, of course. And then nine trades go. So that was my confidence. <laughs> That's better. crazy. That's crazy. The actually. best thing that ever happened to me, though. I learned a lot from it. So, of course, you can turn bad experiences into lessons. But how did you actually become that asset that you were talking about? So there's a lot of things and there's many things. There's a lot of unwiring that had to go through my mind throughout the years from a, both a technical and a psychological standpoint. Mm -hmm. I'd always been sold on the idea and this wasn't from Mark because he was actually telling me the opposite, but from outside influences, I used to follow many different people. And that was my problem is that I had too many voices in my head. Okay. So mm -hmm. because I had too many voices in my head, the interpretations of how to trade the market were differentiating and it was like a wave going up and down. There was no set way for me to focus my, my attention on. Whereas Mark's always in my ear telling me certain things on webinars, calls, whatever it might be. And so he kept telling me your mind is very important, your mind's very important. And I never understood it because I thought logically that my answer is gonna be in the market, as many people do think. And then as I started to realize through time, I'm like, I've got a brilliant trading plan because we use something called a trading trident. I don't know if Mark's mentioned this, but a trading trident. And I, and I say this to everybody, even on my own YouTube channel, that it is the easiest way to sum up the most difficult sport, which is trading on the planet. You can sum it up in three ways. I can solve this for anybody. Number one, you've got to have an edge. Obviously, we know that. Yeah. Number two, you've got to have a trading rules or a trading plan to materialize the edge. But there's a mm -hmm. final element that people miss out, which is your trading psychology, which is going to be the very thing that runs your rules on autopilot. And if the rules aren't run on autopilot, your edge can't materialize. It's a three-way working system, right? Now, what people do is they focus on trident one and two not number three. Yes. So it's like a circuit. If you have a, br a break in the circuit, you can't light the light bulb. Sure. And the light bulb represents trading profitability. So I started to understand, I looked at my trades and I thought, well, I'm following my plan. I've got a clear edge, but why is it? I can't, for example, duplicate or replicate to any degree my backtesting results in my live market performance. That's when I started to realize backtesting is a load of nonsense. And I was like, why is that? Why is it I've always been told that the more you backtest, the more confident you'll get. Why is this myth sold to people in the industry today? Because it makes people feel adequate that the more I do, the more I'm gonna return and the more money I'm gonna make because it's an identity crisis. Yes. Right? Now, trading, as you guys know, especially when you get to professional level, it becomes part-time in the sense that you're not even trading much. Trading is not about trading in itself. Exactly, so yeah. When I realized that, right, and um, this took me a lot of loss, a lot of pain, torment, frustration, sleepless nights of trying to figure out what's going wrong here. I was like, wow, all these things are a lie. It's not about following your plan. It's about how you follow your plan and doing it well. It's about making sure you're understanding the brain and how it works. So I went into two, three years of deep dive work in psychology. And um, it was insane after that. So there were multiple different tweaks that happened over the years that compounded and then made me the trader that I am today. Would you want to share some of the most important lessons about psychology that you learned during those two to three years that helped you the most? You know, there are a lot of traders watching us right now and they for sure are struggling with psychology because it's one of the most important aspects. What would you say that helped you the most? First things first, a lot of, and this goes the same with technical knowledge, a lot of what you learn out there is nonsense. And I say that with full respect to everybody else because a lot of uh, people giving you psychological information or advice out there either are not clinical psychologists, which you don't have to be, because again, a lot of clinical psychologists are clueless about trading psychology, which is a different sector, and they confuse psychology with neuroscience. They're not the yeah. same thing. Right. Psychology is very subjective. They don't even know what a thought is. But um, it also goes with the technical information as well. So yes, you can learn about the amygdala and the left brain and the neocortex and all these different things, which are still relevant. but. It's the same thing of people drowning in knowledge and starving of wisdom. Absolutely. Right, so they've got all this knowledge, but they don't know what to do with it. 
And I spent two years doing this. And I realized in the end, I'm like, it all goes back to you, your image, how you view yourself. And the analogy yes. that I use, because I come from a fighting background, is that it's like an instructor or a fighting coach teaching you the best techniques in the world, but your confidence is shit. Right. None of that technique is going to get applied in the rink. Whereas the fighter who's more confident, who knows in his mind, even though it might not logically make sense that he's going to win, he's got a far greater chance. As a trader, one thing I realize is that if I've got all this information in my head about the brain and how to use it, I can do whatever I want in terms of emotional regulation, which can come through many things like um, muscle tension, breathing regulation, physical sensations. Um, you've got a heart rate, which is directly linked to your fight flight. There's so many different things, which I'll dive into in a second. I can do all of that, but that's like a first aid kit. It's not actually fixing the problem. It's just preventing it temporarily before it seeps in later. So to make that clearer, I realized that my problem as a trader first I had to identify was what? Because I'm only two types of traders. Either you're a hesitator or you're an impulsive trader. There's no in between. I was an impulsive trader. All right. I had a massive amount of impulsivity. So what I would do is I would take a trade that I justified in the moment. Because remember, we rationalize our emotional state. Yeah. My emotional state was to get involved in the market. So my left brain would pick out things analytically in the market to justify that emotional bias. So then what would happen is afterwards I would realize I shouldn't have taken that trade. Why did I get involved in it? And I would have this regretful situation that would occur eight, nine, ten times a month. And I was like, wait, if I was just more patient 50% of the time, I would have made more money. Right. So then I decided to get down to the nitty gritty and realize what exact thoughts am I having before I take these trades? And let me figure that out post trade because then it won't be bias driven because the outcome right. is already gone. Sure. So little tweaks like that. And then I noticed there was a certain dialogue that was going on in my mind that was saying, well, if you, if you don't get, take this trade and it goes on to make you seven, eight, nine, ten percent 10%, how are you going to judge yourself? Just take the trade and don't be a perfectionist. I'd have all this dialogue in my mind. That would be the gravitational pull that would pull me into taking the trade. All I had to do now, once I identified that, was just hedge it, flip it on its head. So if my mind is re re revealing that same dialogue in the moment again, I've just got to do the opposite. But when you bring the intangible, i.e. the thoughts, into the tangible on paper, your brain emotionally processes that differently. This time, so I started to build sheets, right? And Mark talks about this in our program, in yeah. Hawaii, they're called error thoughts. Once I got all these noted down on sheet format, I used to put them in a punch pocket in a pl plastic sleeve. I used to pull them out the next time a trade like that used to occur that I knew fit the plan, but it was higher in risk, for example, lower in probability. Normally a trader would have justified. I'd be like, wait, we're probabilistic people as traders. Right. From a probability standpoint, this has cost me money, these thoughts, these expensive thoughts to have. That's All amazing. Stay out. Yeah. So. That's an amazing way to look at it, actually. And I found yeah. really interesting, I found really interesting what you were mentioning about, you know, fighting. Because I, I used to play basketball in the past and I used to train so much every single day. But at the end of the day, um, there was a period of my life where I wasn't playing so good. And I realized exactly that it was because I wasn't seeing myself as a good player. So I wasn't confident enough, basically. And the same comes down to trading as well. It applies to trading. Uh, so I found very interesting that analogy that you had with fighting. And I found very interesting as yeah. well the cards. Yeah. Absolutely. And l let me ask you something just to go, go back a little bit. You said something really interesting. And I think we could be, uh, you know, in a podcast for like 20 hours talking about <laughs> everything you, you, you quoted in a, in a couple of minutes, um, just a couple of minutes ago. But let me ask you, because I've seen, you know, the majority of traders right now, because in this company, I follow maybe more the, the mindset perspective of, of the yeah. students. And I've seen this situation where like 95% of them are just overwhelmed. So some of them don't even care about the mindset side, the psychology side, and we can go technical or we can stay practical, but there is some people not even thinking about that. Some of them, has maybe years of experience and already understood like I need to stay practical and not just get, you know, masturbating with technical ideas and stuff like that. But what would you suggest like today, let's say nine, nine out of 10 people watching us are just overwhelmed. So they learned a bunch of stuff. Now they learn other stuff. Maybe they are contradicting each other. You know, it, it can happen when you study this kind of um, arguments that one mentor contradict the other ones. So what would you suggest to these people? Like, where would you start 
if you were overwhelmed in this situation, talking about the psychology perspective? Yeah, very, very simple. So if we can sum it all up and conclude it for everybody, let's begin as if we're a brand new trader, right? So we've never touched trading before. It's our first yeah. time. We see all this information. We don't know what to do with it. Yeah. My advice to all of you is the first thing you got to look at, because if we look at study all professional traders or even new professional traders, institutional level traders, actual institutional level traders, right? The real guys. We look at one thing they had in common. If you look at Jesse Livermore, you look at Ro uh, Richard Dennis, one of the best commodities traders in the world at the time. He had a 10% strike rate and he made more money in his career than any trader could even dream of. So this is why I say strike rate is, don't get me started on this anyway. <laughs> so I've got a lot of interesting points. You look at these guys and something that they found that, you had in, that they had in common was that it took them 10 to 15 years almost to realize one thing that they tried to crack the market to only realize there's no crack to the market. Right. That there just isn't. So the easiest and first solution I can give to everybody is in the age of information, it's very easy to find a system that can give you an edge. Yeah. That's number one. So find a system with an edge. The edge, uh, degree, the degree of the edge is irrelevant in my opinion. You could have a 40% edge. You could have an 80, it doesn't matter what your edge is as long as you have an upper hand to some degree in the market because a system is only going to be as profitable as a trader is, number one. Number two is make sure that you're actually getting involved around people that you want to live a life like, but secondly, they embody values that you want because I can't fathom being, you know, trading five, six hundred, a million on my own, in my own bedroom, in the dark, lonely, with no friends and no circle and nobody to share that with and eating ice cream every day and getting fat. It's yeah. boring, right? Trading is actually boring. And people need to understand that a lot of people in the public space think trading is this really fun thing that you sat at the screens all the time and you're clicking away on cocaine. It's not like that, <laughs> yeah, right? Um, but, but it's actually more so about being sharp for those very few moments in the week where you've got to make decisions once, twice, or three times, and that's it. And they're very expensive decisions or very profitable decisions. That's number two. So get yourself around a circle. It's extremely crucial. And this circle has to have a strong infrastructure. Infrastructure meaning that you're financially taken care of in terms of if I was to if I was a trader in your ecosystem today, fresh one, right? And I'm finding a, a new ecosystem to learn, a new mentor, community space, or whatever. And I now all of a sudden I'm trading five hundred k or a million dollars, whatever it is, and I'm making a substantial amount of money. But the person that I'm learning off has only ever traded a funded account, and they have no clue about asset management or wealth, cash flow, businesses. They've got no life experience. How is that a mentor anymore? Because a mentor and a coach are different. Absolutely. Right. Coach is Absolutely. more skilled related, but a mentor yeah. should have the main things figured out, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah. So like what I love about your guys' infrastructure, you got, you know, your property taken care of, crypto, trading. That's what I as exa an example and testament to you guys, you got a solid infrastructure. So people should look at that and think, right, if I was to stay here for the next four or five years and why not build friendships with these people for the rest of my yeah. lives, which is what I embody so so deeply, I wanna make sure that my skill as a trade as a trader is solely it's, it's just a vehicle. Because trading, your account, it's simply a vehicle to provide for other assets, to create cash flow, to build wealth through. That's where people have got it wrong. I don't doubt that you can make an income of trading. I have for a long time. Sure. But it's stressful. <laughs> right. That to rely strictly on trading is silly. From a financial point of view, I, we don't want to get into tax aid, but even from a tax perspective, it's silly. Absolutely. Can, so many more advantages you can have. So that's number two. Number three, in terms of who to learn off, goes back to my first point. Who you're learning off. Don't solely look at how they trade. Look at who they are as an individual. Are they professional? Do they carry themselves well? Because if you're learning off a Muppet who has no professionalism and doesn't have any <coughs> bearing, they have no values, and you've seen, and don't, I don't read reviews, I just look at people straight. You can read by their body language, uh, authenticity, their actions, who they are. Would I trust this person to raise my children? Because we've got to take trading out for, out for a minute. They're a mentor to you. They, they, your future is in their hands. Yeah. Absolutely. So why would you not trust this person to look after your children, for example? It's a very good um, anchor point to use. So if, if people are looking at people on social media and they're very unprofessional, they've not got much character about them, these kind of things, stay away from that. System is irrelevant. Just look at a system that gives you an edge. Psychology, again, do they have a psychology program? Where do you start? I mean, we've got our own program, so I'm always going to point towards that. And that's really it, to be honest. There's nothing more complicated to it. Absolutely. And you said something really important. I mean, in 2023, not paying attention like with this you know thought process you, you just explained about which people you're seeing on social medias because you know we and i think you too but we we have seen the behind the scenes of a lot of people that maybe are big yeah. on social media yeah. right 
I think you had the opportunity. I will, I will not share any names, but big or bigger or shorter, but there is a lot of people that just show stuff and spend basically everything to show stuff, right? Yeah. The, the problem is that for, for the people listening that you cannot understand that just looking at social media. So I remember, you, you made me remember a mentor of mine that said, a mentor, not a coach, just to stay in the argument, that said, millionaires don't have always the Ferrari, the Lamborghini or whatever. I'm not saying that if they have that, they are not millionaire, but it doesn't mean that if they have that, they are. Because maybe they spent everything to just show the, the Lambo to you, right? And it's a big, big problem because I've seen like people and even students that of mine like that studied for like two three four years from the wrong person yeah and then you have to work even harder from a psychology standpoint from a even maybe for also for the skill set standpoint for everything but we need to be really careful about that because it's risky to study from the wrong person for like two three four years and i think th this was a great point because not a lot of people are talking about that yeah even because the majority of people are that person we're trying to avoid. So it, it makes sense. Not, not so many people are talking about that. But I, I think, yeah, that's, that's key. Because people build in, uh, the, their experience incorrectly as well. So people say, well, I've been trading five years, but maybe you've been doing the same thing for five years incorrectly. Exactly. You're, you have exactly. been trading one day multiplied for like five years. Yeah. Yeah, because it's, it's it's like the negative compound of knowledge. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Like is the negative standpoint is the positive standpoint to it. So yeah, 100% agree with that. Exactly. And you also said that, of course, from a technical point of view, you can learn different stuff from a lot of people. You can learn it on YouTube, you can learn it everywhere, but you need to actually select correctly who you're learning from and what you're learning. Because yeah. nowadays, everyone can have a YouTube channel. Anyone can pull up a chart and say stuff on how they heard yeah. that the market works yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Um, Very good point that because... Yeah. One thing I want to mention here that people need to understand about strategy. Strategy is just an interpretation of when to buy and sell. Yes. Yeah. The, the trade never plays out because your analysis was right. There's no such thing. We people think, oh, the trade played out because my analysis said so. No, the trade played out because the market volume was on your side at that point. That's, that's literally yes. it. Yes. So your, your analysis and your, your system is only supposed to give you an edge of some kind. And I know it's so simple, but people ignore that. So... I mean, even if you look at the, the candles moving up and down, that's simply due to an imbalance in orders coming into the exchanges every day. It's an imbalance. If everybody had the same way to look at the market, the market would be flatlined. Yeah. The market right. literally moves off of interpretation. So like the way we trade is tracking that interpretation through price patterns. That's literally it. And it's so simple. I, uh, I have a friend of mine who used to trade for Citibank for nine years. He was, on the, he was on the options floor. This guy still trades support and resistance. Yeah. And he's he's and he's he's gone obviously into the he's become a retail investor now he's got, gone out of the institution, but he would say to me, he goes these guys trade in, in no complicated fashion, but they just have access to different data, they're reading yeah. the actual order flow charts, they've got way better liquidity than anybody could ever dream of, and the purpose by which institutions and banks trade are different to why retail investors trade, they yeah. don't trade to simply just make money. There's a lot of macroeconomical factors that dive into, it, and yeah. I think a lot of people at home behind their screens in their offices learning about trading through the internet or people through YouTube who have no clue what they're talking about most of the time yeah all they're listening to is well this is how you can crack the market and this is how you can do this but <laughs> if you just go back in history it will tell you the answer some of the best traders in the planet will tell you that they did the same thing for 15 years to realize it wasn't the way forward you know absolutely so, um, absolutely yeah it's it's a trend to just you know talk about the holy grail of trading you know that you found how the banks move the market and all, all of this stuff but i touched this point multiple times uh in my videos and i always say you know there is this trend with traders about smart money and so on i personally do use some smart money concepts in my strategy but what i always always say is that the whole point of trading is to have an edge if you find it with certain concepts or with some other concepts, at the end of the day, you have your edge. There are people who use smart money and they have no fucking idea of what they're doing. And there are people who don't use it and still have no idea what they're doing. Exactly. Yeah. No, I totally agree with that. Because yeah. I feel like that's even SMC is something that people have taken out of context. You know, like it's like Chinese whispers. Like one person will start from saying one thing and another person will start from saying Completely. Yeah. And then this is how it ends up, you know, and then, then it gets given a, a totally bad name 
yeah and um it's it's just it's beyond me the the battle as to how to trade and this trend that's occurred is the most foolish and childish thing that i think has given trading such a bad yeah. name this is why i don't tell people i'm a trader when i meet right them. right i just tell them i trade commodities or something okay like okay a, fx i'm not mentioning it to anybody in the public <laughs> yeah it makes um, sense for when you meet them for the first time you don't mention right i do the same the, usually i do the they, same they start, they start hiding the wallet as soon as I mention yeah. FX. <laughs> 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 so, That's crazy. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, I feel you. I understand. Do, do you remember any talent was student in particular? And if so, which was his talent? A talented student? Um, oh, many. There, there, was a, there was actually a couple that I coached. I started coaching around the end of... 2021 so december 2021 is when i started coaching the first student that I took on was a bit of a close friend of mine as well um he wasn't from he was from overseas mm -hmm. and um he we obviously started our own in-house proprietary firm that year in april and he tried trading on that and all we had was a six percent pass mark and he struggled to, to make six percent uh, in that entire six month period so he reached out to me and we dove in and because obviously he's a bit closer to me as well i, I gave him some like one-to-one -one hand on hands-on work more often and we took his trading and it accelerated to him making 120 something percent in a single quarter, but sustainably. Really? Um, th because there was so much opportunity that that first quarter of 2022, it was very liquid. And he capitalized on it. I reviewed all his trades, they were fantastic. The only problem that was left was insecurity. And I'll tell right. you how I know this. And I'll speak by his talent in a second as well. His talent was, he was very good at technicals. He was very good at spotting trades. He was very good at spotting ideas in the market. Now, the thing with traders is when they see an opportunity, do they perceive it as an opportunity to make money or to lose money? Because it differentiates. Yeah. An impulsive trader will always see an opportunity as an opportunity sure. to make money. They will never look at the opposite because they're yes. bias driven. But we won't dive into that anyway. So he was very technically driven, right? And now his, that, his passion or his talent or his strength became his weakness because his passion consumed him. It's like a fire can either cook your food or it can take a house down. Yeah. So his passion was like the fire where he started to question everything in the market. Every loss that he had, he thought there was a reason behind that mm -hmm. loss that he had to figure out. It's what we call the Cartesian paradigm. It's the world that we live in today where everything has to be quantified and made into logical, right? So his talent became his, his, uh, his uh, detriment. And then Q2 and Q3 come of last year. And he'd scaled, he was trading in Canadian dollars. He was trading around equivalent to pounds. He was trading about 70 or 80,000 pounds, so roughly $100,000 personal money. Mm -hmm. And he'd scaled that to, to quite a, a bit of an amount in Q1. But it came to a point where he wanted to start on the Falcon Fund again from a 10K account. Mm -hmm. He struggled to because he said, what if I lose it? I said, are you crazy? What, what's going to happen if you lose it? I said, I hope you do lose it because that's going to toughen you up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what is that? I said, because you know, he was making quite a bit of money. The, the fee was like $1,000 compared to what he was making. That was pennies to him. It was nothing. So I said, you're not practically going to lose anything. And how I knew he was very fearful and that insecurity was showing was that he was saying, I want to risk 0.25%, which would give him 20 trades. And I said, how much drawdown do you go in logically? 5% at most. So even if you risk half a percent, you're only going to go down 10%. So you're, you're, you're talking of insecurity and fear here right now. I tried my absolute best to strip that out of him. I did my best as a friend, as a, as a coach as well. Mm -hmm. He's not here anymore. He's left. All of a sudden, just put the phone down, gone. And um, he's trading with somebody else now. And I said to him, oh, well, so look, as a friend, I will tell you this. Because he said to me, am I making the right decision? No one's going to listen to you at that stage anyway. But I said, look, you're either going to go down two paths. Path number one, this works out for you and I hope it does. Path number two, your psychological issues still show themselves. No matter how, how high of a mountain you go to, and yeah. how deep in the ocean you go, they're going to find you because you're living with your brain. You can't Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um... So that was that. So I've had a few students like that. Some are still here. One student was um, minus 80% in 2020 at the end of the year. And now he's trading six figures. So that's in the span of seven months, though. And six figures from 10K to 40 to 80 and so on, so sustainably. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had yeah. many of those cases. But one thing I found with students that are talented as a trait, I would more so replace the word talent with um, discipline. They are yeah. extremely, when I say disciplined, you tell them one thing and they'll do it consistently for six months. Really? They won't overcomplicate it. Yeah. I, I, I make something called invoice sheets for them, uh -huh. which is a little bit of a, a trick, right? So we say to them, you want to track two things practically to improve your trading. 
and any, any trader can do this actually, it doesn't matter how you trade. Number one is your rule congruency rate, which is how often you stick into your plan per week. Mm -hmm. So that's abbreviated in the invoice sheet. That has to be 100%. Right. Number two is a risk rating. So if all the trades that you're taking are coming from the plan and they're also low risk, which means they're high probability, and you follow that ratio of 100 to zero every week, 100% congruency and 0% risk, and you do that consistently for one quarter, it's impossible that your account will scale. And we've got data to show this, that traders that have consistently actually followed that particular ratio, their accounts are scaled. Now, the only thing that was in the way of these traders scaling was this. Oh, because the only thing that will help them in the moment be able to assess a trade and say, it fits the plan, but I shouldn't take it because it's high risk. And then they end up taking the trade. The only thing that can stop them is that. Yes. So that's how we that's how we take it. So that the most talented traders, I would say, are the ones that they keep it the most simple and they don't overcomplicate things. They're not flashy at all. Yeah, absolutely. And it's amazing, you know, these two things that they need to keep track of. Yeah. It really helps. But at the end of the day, as you said, if they're not disciplined enough, it doesn't count. It doesn't count. It doesn't help. Um, but did you see many cases where they had, you know, all the practical stuff to actually make it, but then they were not sticking. They were just not working on their psychology, maybe. Yeah, so I'm smiling because um, almost every single student that I've coached, mm -hmm. I've given them the same template. Now, a lot of people might look at that and think, whoa, isn't everybody? <laughs> yeah. Another massive misconception that people have in trading is that your personality matters. Now, this is going to hit a lot of nails, uh, hit a lot of nails, <laughs> sorry. And I, I'm only saying this because I've experienced this through almost 105, 106 people. Mm -hmm. okay. and I've counted and including myself, right? So there's a lot of case studies to prove this. A lot of people say, uh, find something that fits your personality as a trader. You have to, otherwise if you don't trade something that fits your personality, then you're gonna go down this wrong path. This is another thing as trying to say, find a more accurate system. And I'll tell you why this makes sense. Every trader should only have one personality and that's a trader's personality. So we, we all know in here that your environment wins no matter what. Yeah. If you put somebody in solitary confinement in prison for one year, they're gonna change. If you if you hang around nine recreational drug users, you'll become the 10th, right? Your environment always trumps your will. So the markets are an environment for your brain because your brain perceives them as uncertainty, as a threat. It's a threatful environment to your brain. Now, because you're, in, you're, you're actually operating in live trading in this case, in an uncertain environment consistently, the neural circuits in your brain are changing through time. Yeah. This is why I say you can't actually achieve that through backtesting because it's simulated and it's not real. So because of that emotional involvement and that financial trauma in the market that you experience, micro traumas over the years, your brain and neural circuits are changing around that. So your personality is naturally going to change. Now it's up to you whether you control, it's like a fire, whether you control that personality to change correctly or incorrectly. This is why you guys would have seen yourself as well with some of your students or even just generally in public. We've seen it with ours, yeah. where um, the flame is out of control and they've been trading the market four or five years and they've become worse and not better. But the students that got it under control through nailing down on certain things which I mentioned, they actually became a trader, which is impartial and balanced thinking. It's desensitization to money, mm -hmm. which is not easy and you have to be a little bit yeah. mentally insane. Yeah, absolutely. Right, right. Absolutely. You know, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. you can't just sit there at a dinner table and think, oh, I've just lost 80,000 pounds in a trade and carry <laughs> like it's nothing. Yeah. So all these things through time. Now, this is why I say to traders that don't stop finding something that fits you. Your first personality is broken anyway when you come into trading, for yes. trading that is. What may have worked for you in business, in other jobs or something else that's paying you drastically well, a, a lot amount of money, that mindset's not gonna work for you in trading. So it might make you money somewhere else, but don't bring that mindset into trading. It's like telling your mind to sit in a pack of lions and meditate. Your brain yeah. work doesn't work like that. It's fight or flight. So when it comes to the traders that you mentioned, I, I, I categorize them in three categories. And this is for any single trader out there. Category A, B, and C. Category A are traders who are not profitable and not trading at scale, number one. Number two, traders who are profitable, but they're not trading at scale. Mm -hmm. And number three is traders who are profitable and are trading at scale. Now, category three don't need coaching because they, they are where they want to be now. But one and two categorically have the same roadblocks in front of them, whether we like it or not. Category A traders, why are they not profitable and why are they not trading at scale? Number one, why is the equity curve declining? Yeah. An equity curve is a very good reflection of your state of mind. But number one, why is it declining? Lack of consistency behind rules. They don't know where to get in and where to get out. Number two, 
they don't know how to categorize a setup between one that's worth taking and one that's not worth taking. So there's one thing, a trade fitting the plan, which is like a plane with two wings. It has to have two wings. Plane number, uh, wing number one is fitting the plan. Number two is what risk is that trade? Traders only look at one wing. A plane with one wing is going to crash. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah. you know, so that's the number, number one. Category number mm -hmm. two, though, traders who are profitable, but they're not yet trading at scale, that's primarily psychology, no technicals. So this is why when I assess traders, I look at I look at them as category A or B first. And I initially, I thought I was a little bit loopy, right? Because I thought, well, maybe yeah. I'm looking at this incorrectly when I first started coaching these guys. But over 105, 110 people now, I've realized that they're all exactly the same, yet so different. That's amazing. Let me let me connect you with, with one principle that um, came to my mind, the, the three layers of behavioral change. Because I want you to extrapolate something for, for people listening now. Because, do you know, uh, James Kidder talks about this and you have three different layers where the, the bigger one is the outcomes, the second one is about the processes and the, the middle one, the center one, is about identity. So basically, what you want, what you have to do and how you see yourself, basically, right? And the majority of traders, but whatever, it, it can be the same with any industry, just focuses on the outcome. So I want to get funded X million dollars i want to get to these specific income percentages whatever right just the outcomes and and then from that they go through okay what do i need to do so the process is and then i'm gonna become a profitable trader right with this direction from the outside to the the identity right and only a few people start from the identity going in the other way so there is no one layer more important than the others but basically the problem with the majority of people as james clear so and i've been able to see working with students and training people is basically the direction of the change right so i wanted to ask you what do you think are like the the top five character traits for a profitable trader because i i want to get to to go a little bit deeper later then but if you have to describe the perfect quote unquote perfect identity for a trader after seeing hundreds of people in the last couple of years, which are the five best, more important character traits to show as a profitable trader? Number one uh, would be again, impartial thinking, impartial mm -hmm. thinking, completely balanced thinking, which is achieved through many different things. Number yeah. one. Number two, as I mentioned before as well, desensitization is very important. Now that doesn't mean you become like a robot because that's impossible, but it means that you're not attaching your self worth to the outcome of the trade which happens through a lot of pain. The number three, what I would say is that there's no emotional carry through from trade A to trade B. Yeah, so absolutely. That's really important. Each individual circumstance independently, which people think by reading trading in the zone, they're going to achieve. It doesn't work. If, if trading in the zone was the reason you were going to get to there, then many more people would be successful. <laughs> Very good book though. I'm not taking away from it. It's fantastic. Yeah. Number four, Number four, I would say they know how to deal with winning very well. Mm -hmm. A lot of people focus on dealing with losing, but they don't yeah. focus on how to deal with winning. We've, again, as you guys may have seen as well, we've got the stats on this, that when, I think it's something, something between when 92% of traders experience a big win or a big set of wins, that they actually go down a losing streak straight after. So the question is, what happens when they win in their mind? Do they believe they deserve it? Yeah, yeah. Right? Is it, because people just say, oh, it's euphoria. Okay, that's a simple Google search. That's not difficult to understand that. But most people, it's not, they're not euphoric. It's just because they've identified themselves as someone who doesn't deserve having that kind of money. So yeah. they find ways to give it back. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Um, that's a great um, point. I mean, that's, that's yeah. so important. That's a very important, important yeah. point. Yeah. Especially when you, when you start trading at more scale, like, it's like 3% goes from being 3K to then 12K and then 20K and more. The final trade that I would say that's extremely crucially important, and this ties this categorizes everything into the emotional intelligence here is um losing very well now that doesn't mean dealing with losses mm -hmm. it's complete i mean losing well losing well means going back to the same point again that you're not looking at that trade from a bias driven perspective so there's actually a diagram funny enough i've actually done a video on this recently i don't know if you guys can see that um so it's a little we bit can say it, yeah yeah i'm not an art major but <laughs> what you have here at the back you have the trade and then at the front, you have how it presents itself to you. Now, people don't see it this way, right? People think what they're seeing on the market is exactly how it is. But it's not. It's reflecting back at you. And that, that little scribble that I did at the front, that little glass, mm -hmm. 
is your emotions, thoughts, biases, beliefs, and programming. Nice. All of that is reflecting back to you. Now, I'm not saying that everything in the market is psychology, but the mo- the majority is. So that's the final trait I would say is that the only way to clean that glass and to see the trade behind it for what actually what it actually is is unwiring all the negative beliefs, programming, thoughts, emotions that you've got, and um, witnessing them, not judging them in the moment. This is what people do. So they start to listen to their thoughts too much, and then the psychology is pulling the strings for them in the trading, and not them. They think it's them, but it's their mind doing the trading. Yes. Yeah. And so that's the final trait I would say. So where they can actually find themselves to calm themselves in the moment, when there's a storm going on, that you're calm in the heat of the moment, and you can make rational, assessed, calculated decisions. Which is very difficult, but that's the final bit. Okay, how how do you how do you go and train for that part? Because I think we, you you said something before. You know, we can work with breathing exercises, with relaxing the body, with a lot of different uh, perspectives and approaches, right? Yeah. Do you have different approaches? Because for for what I've seen is that um, for some people, one specific meditation can work, and then for Another person is completely wrong. I mean, it's not that season of their life. Maybe it's not um, congruent with their belief system or something like that. So with somebody, maybe there is a different approach uh, that you can have even without breathing exercises, just different thought processes. So how do you how do you train people on that last point you you explain? Because I have different ideas on that, but I, I'm I'm curious about how do you deal with that? Okay, so one way to explain this is this. As a fighter, this is what I can relate back to. Yeah. Training in the bag and fighting in the ring is different, right? Yeah. So I was very good in the bag, but until I realized I've got to be very confident in the ring, it's a different ball game. So I, 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 I make it into an analogy for traders that I coach that yeah. completely. We're gonna coach you. We're gonna train you to trade uh, to not trade on the bag to hit the bag, <laughs> and then also train you to fight in the ring. Mm-hmm. There's gonna there's gonna be a calculated way to do that. So this is very simple. Number one term: emotional regulation, which is done through four things particularly. Now, what traders need to sh- keep track of is your breathing style your heart rate, muscle tension, and physical sensations. These four things, that's it. Mm-hmm. So in the moment, and it could be different for everybody, this is why it's situational for each trader. All they have to do is look at, in the moment of taking a trade or leading up to it, are they tense anywhere in their body? And I prom- I guarantee, if a trader is not where they want to be, they'll be tense somewhere. Your eyes will be tense, your jaw will be tense, or your leg, or whoever, or whatever, sorry. That's number one, relieve that tension, because what that's doing, from a scientific standpoint, is it's driving more blood to that part of the body it's stripping the not completely but it's limiting the oxygen supply from your brain because you more blood needs more oxygen and yeah, it's yeah. triggering fight flight response in your body yeah. when that happens you can't think logically you can only think emotionally it's impossible to think logically in that moment that's number one your breathing style is also directly connected to fight flight and fear uh, the, the development of fear so if you're breathing very fast or you're, you're holding your breath fear can arise in the brain and then you're never thinking from an, uh, a logical yeah. standpoint and you're thinking from a limbic emotional standpoint number two mm-hmm. Number three uh, is physical sensation. Okay, physical sensation is crucially important because if you don't look after that and you don't assess, well, I've got a feeling in my stomach I need to take care of, do some belly breathing and that kind of stuff. Now, all these things that I'm saying, as I said before, it's a first aid kit. It's not the cure. It's just a way for you to now relax the mind, uh, the body first, sorry, so then the mind can be relaxed. But the next step is something that we go into in Rewired as well. It's called thought deconstruction. This is mindfulness practice, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it's different for everybody, but what we we have a meditation, a guided meditation, but we say to people, look, try this for yourself. As you're literally about to take the trade, or with 10 minutes or 20 minutes before, you need to write, no, don't just think about it, but write down the exact thoughts that you're having. And the better the people that can do this, the better results they're going to have. And actually look at those thoughts and write no filter. Sometimes I used to write this down, I've still got notes. I need to get in the trade, but what if this happens? But what if this happens? And then this, and I would write down a full script. Then I would read that at the end of the week, and I would think my mind is total chaos. <laughs> so through time, I deconstructed thoughts because what is a thought? Nobody knows. Is it an electrical impulse? Like where does a thought yeah. come from? But I started to debate with the thought. So you have three questions. Um, who are you? You ask the thought that, and it disappears. Number two, what's your intent? Mm-hmm. And why are you here? Yeah. What's your motive? When you ask the thought this question in your mind, it disappears, but then you realize there's actually nothing behind the thought. And you think a thought has a life and a death, it just goes. Yeah, right. they the just thought. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So the more you practice that, the more you sort of dissolve these thoughts over time, and the less they actually do the decision making for you in the moment. 
I've, I've, I've summarized it there it goes into a lot more detail but that's how we do it so emotional regulation breathing meditation it's the first aid kit the rest you go deeper into it thought deconstruction okay okay so we with any traders j just understand like d you do follow these these kind of points so with all of them you, you guys teach first medi the meditation the breathing the yeah. the control your body also because for example like maxim was, was talking about the fact that and you, you were quoting this before if you are completely relaxed like if all your body is completely relaxed it's almost it's basically scientifically impossible to feel stress anxiety yeah. or shit like that so yeah. you always start also from that you don't maybe only approach with the the the, the constructing of the thoughts without I mean, the breathing or stuff like that it's different i mean it depends on the trader most sometimes okay i would say to them um so i'll give you an example so there was a guy who was compulsively addicted to video games okay mm -hmm. and we i didn't know this at the start i had to get it out of him because i said to him <laughs> go, look you're literally how he was trading i was like there's a pattern in his trading which is very interesting that he would say in his comments after his trade, I knew I shouldn't have taken it, but I, I still got involved in it, right? So it's a similar thing to what we mentioned. Mm -hmm. And um, I asked him, I said, is there a, and there has to be, it's impossible otherwise. Do you have this same behavioral pattern in something else in your life? He was like, no. I said, it's impossible, think about it. <coughs> he goes, well, you know, sometimes on the weekend, I know I shouldn't be video gaming and then yeah. I just end up playing for five hours. All right, and yeah. I said, what about gym? Do you ever train? He goes, I mean, sometimes I go, but then, I just like, I just can't be bothered. I said, this is the same mindset. Fix that in the outside of your life because as a trader, you're changing yourself as a person. Yeah. yeah. You can't be the person without being the person yourself first. So I said, you want to do these things. Every, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not dissatisfaction, but anything that's not convenient in your life. Mm -hmm. Do that. Do things when they're not convenient. Yes. And do things when you say you're not going to do them, just do them. Discipline, daily action. Yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. so weird how because that's how your brain brings confidence it's Completely. like in the gym if you say to yourself i'm going to do 10 reps and you do 12 that's scientifically <laughs> yeah. proven to give you self-esteem and confidence yeah yeah so if these traders understood how they're doing things in the outside life is going to affect their trading because it's the same person making the same decisions so yeah the trading would change and that's how we deal with that so it's, it differentiates yeah yeah absolutely but you, you you said something we were smiling because of the the 10 push-up right and, and yeah, do, he, do more he always does it yeah <laughs> I, yeah and we, we yeah. talked about that like i don't know maybe every day about uh, exactly. some example or something you know the idea of doing one more uh, yeah honestly i stole that from ed my he was talking about that like in a podcast and also in his book and i think that that is really practical for anybody listening like when for example if you do workouts every day maybe you, you don't do that but if you for example i have the habit now to do let's say i do at least 10 times per day one push-up you know uh, with 20 30 reps whatever but 10 times per day i'm reaffirming to myself i'm super confident because i always do one more and if i catch myself like for example okay now i'm gonna do 30 push-ups and i catch myself in my mind like no it's 31 now i have to do 32 and then if i keep catching myself with, with this kind of thought, it's always one more and one more, one more. But like for me, in just a couple of weeks and months, it made a huge difference. And I think this is one of the most applicable things for anybody. Because for example, if somebody is already reading and read 10 pages per day, just read 11. You know, you can apply this with whatever area of your life. But as you said, like you can change the, the person you are even outside of trading and then have the, you know, the consequences in, in trading, but you, you didn't work on that. How you do one thing is how you do everything else. This yeah. is the fact of, fact of it. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I used to do the same thing where at the gym or wherever, even if it was when I was doing my Thai boxing, my, when my instructor wasn't looking and we had 10 seconds left of the round, I'd slow down a little bit when he wasn't looking. Mm -hmm. But in my yeah. mind, I'd said to myself that I've already done enough. I've started off well. I'm not going to finish well. It seeped into my trading as well. I would always start my months off really well. And all right them really poorly. it's and super super yeah. interesting how many things actually reflect like it's always oh, yeah. that way and for me what i understood is that you know of course we need to be better as persons in order to actually become a better trader yeah. but actually trading was what forced me and i believe is what forced everyone to actually become better you know it started from there I understood that I wasn't going to make it that way. I needed to become better. And then you just start a self-development, self-improvement journey. And it actually 
it was actually all thanks to to trading uh, at least in, in my experience of course i was playing basketball uh, as well before i was doing sport but and of course you need to get better at certain aspects mentally i believe the same with fighting uh in different ways but of course uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah we, we were not fighting that bad right. when we were basketball. Not, like, <laughs> in different ways but but uh, but trading was what actually forced me the most to actually improve. Yeah. Uh, and one key aspect I want to connect to something that you said earlier was that actually, you know, being confident and being okay with managing certain amounts of money. You know, when you start trading, 90% of the time, you are broke. There are people that maybe come from rich parents or whatever, but most of the times you are starting to trade because you actually want to improve your own situation your current situation. So at that point, you realize that, you know, if you want to make percentages and you need to think in terms of percentages, you actually need bigger capital because if you make five, 10, 15% in a month, still, if you don't have access to enough capital, you're not gonna profit anything to actually live. Um, so I would say that I wanted to connect to what you said earlier, that you know getting used to managing and thinking in bigger amounts is crucial and it's yeah. something that every trader needs to work on yeah definitely 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 important because the thing with with prop firms nowadays as well is they don't yeah. in um they've, they've stopped encouraging traders to build their personal accounts yeah which is such a crucial thing because i'm not saying that prop firms are going to go bust because it's a very unlikely circumstance in the way that a lot of them are built up but they they the new day prop firms are basically like brokers in disguise now. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is that the way that they've built up their structure isn't to actually benefit the individual trader. I mean, if it was the case, you would genuinely see a lot more successful traders, but a lot of them, we won't dive into statistics here, but we know they, they it's not illegal be booking, but a lot of them do be book their clients, right? We mm -hmm. know that. And it's not immoral, uh, not illegal, sorry, but it is immoral in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, but again, that risk is open to everyone in publicly. They know that. They, they know the, yeah. the thingy, the, um, the, what comes with it, the territory. But it, it sort of, it plays with people's psychology because now you've got people who've not got access to a network. Now you've got people who sat in the room thinking, if I just save a few hundred dollars up, I can just start to trade 100K capital. But right. Any professional trader would look at that and laugh at them and think, you can't even scale one thousand to two thousand dollars. Right. Just a just a hundred percent. Try. I, I would challenge any trader to trade one thousand dollars or less, and make consistent returns on a small amount of money for six months. If you can be disciplined on that, then you you you've earned your right to trade uh, funded capital or proprietary capital. Yeah. But what we coach our traders on, or we we advise them even, is that when you get to from 10, 40, 80, 160, 320, when you get to that 160, 320 mark, email your broker, print off all the broker statements, compile it and go to an investor and set up an investment contract with somebody because the big money is made there. Yeah. Right? The big money is made there and also the network that you tap into, they've got more money. Now I do think it's pretty foolish to want to trade 20, 30 million as a retail investor because there's not really much difference between 2 million and 5 million. You can still yeah. access the same things. So when people say, oh, I want to trade 20, 30 million, I'm like the, the 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 costs that come with that and the repercussions that come with that, brokers wiping you out, then having to find a, a, an interbank broker of some kind that they can actually give you proper liquidity because you're trading that kind of money. Not that that kind of money is big in the markets, but if you're on a retail broker and you're trading 20, 30 million and you're moving large amounts of volume and, you, and you're profitable, they're gonna spike you out of trades. Yeah, they, they, they just they just will do that. And so, you know, there's a lot of uh, a cheeky business that goes on behind the scenes with these brokers. And it's just not worth the hassle. You're, you're better off trading between two and five million, which is a really good sweet spot of your own personal capital with a trusted broker and yeah. flushing all that money into assets and living your life. And it's so much better that way, in my opinion. Um, uh, people, you know, if they want to handle that kind of money, then open your own proprietary firm or, you know, look towards a hedge fund in the future of some kind as a bigger goal. But it's a different ball game that we're playing with there. But definitely managing large amounts of money is crucially important. And uh, trading investor capital and personal capital and proprietary capital are different types of stress and pressure. And people have to understand that, in my opinion, trading proprietary capital is the most difficult. Mm -hmm. Like managing investor capital it might, it's stressful, but it's not as stressful as managing proprietary capital because the problem with proprietary capital is that you know that you can scale up very quickly. So you're constantly in pursuit all the time. So that's a different kind of stress that you're dealing with. Yeah. Whereas with an investor, you're going to be a bit more calm, right? Knowing that I've only got one chance with this guy. A funny story, my investor that I blew nine trades for, 
mm-hmm. he's my same investor now three years later really <laughs> so you you proved to him that you you were actually able to manage it you, well, you brought a statement or something how did that happen how did that happen what, what, right? what, yes, what's yes. the process <laughs> This is a funny story. I didn't kidnap him. What I did was, uh, <laughs> I, I he, we stayed in touch over the years. So this was 2019 July when I first met him. So I was only trading in Falcon for about a year and two months. And obviously after that happened, we stayed in touch because he said, look, I see potential in you. Just don't quit at what you're doing. And so he saw that I stayed consistent in one space for a long period of time. He didn't even have to ask me how my trading is going. He just said to me, how much do you want? We're ready to set it up. So we set it up really? for a quarter of a million and we're going to get ready on that soon and we're going to go. And I'm shocked and I've learned a lot from that in that nothing is truly negative if you think about it. Mm-hmm. Like nothing yes. is actually negative. When you really look yeah. at it, yeah. at that time, my confidence was down here. I told <clears> everybody I'm going to make a lot of money. My image was broken. I just lost everything after that point. After that investment, mm-hmm. I thought I'm at rock bottom right now. But I'll ask you guys a question from this, right? When does a new day start at midnight, right? Is it yeah. light or dark outside? Dark. It's dark. Dark. So if, if a new day starts when it's dark, how can you not have new beginnings when you're at your low? Right. So think about that. Completely. Right? I know it's so cliche and obvious, but... No, no, no. Completely. Yeah. The, 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 the lessons that you learn and that you need to learn to be the person that you want to be only happen in the low periods. Literally mm. only. You don't learn much by winning. So Absolutely. Absolutely. I learned through that period a lot, you know, and I realized, well, looking back at that, every, all the dots connect. And whichever higher power there is up there is clearly looking down and looking after me because yeah. as long as your energy, energy is channeled right and you're not putting things on a pedestal and you're becoming a person who can attract things into your life, it's like chasing a cat. If you try to chase a cat, it's going to run away. Yeah. And the cat yeah. represents your goals. Right? So that, yeah. I learned all these things and, I, and I'm so grateful for all the lessons, losses. I've just I've lost a lot of stuff in the past, but best thing that ever happened. Let, let me ask you something. Um, just to go back to the 75k loss. Yeah. Okay. So because maybe this is a single story, it's your story, right? But somebody will be right now in a similar situation talking about the, the emotions they are feeling. So let's say yesterday it, it happened, right? How many days or weeks or months did it take to you in order to stop being, you know, impacted by that event? Because I don't know, maybe it took like 24 hours and you were like, fuck that. Let's That's, keep moving. But yeah. I don't know if it was the case because it was the first time you, you, you lost that amount of money. It was not your money. So how did the process went through between the shock, let, let's call it like th- that way of doing, having that loss. And then when did the switch happen? Yeah. Gradually, you just compounded your confidence. What, what do you think happened? After about a few days, I got over it. Okay. Um, and how I did that was this. I was dwelling on it for two days straight, very upset. Okay. The third day I was like, right, I've got two paths I can go down here. Either I can mm. continue carrying, uh, carrying on crying, about yeah. it, I'm mourning about it, or I can actually look at the reality of the situation is that the only move I can make is forward. So I've got to make the best move I possibly can now, which is what? If I look at the past now and I consistently operate in the past, <clears throat> I'm going to replicate the same decisions that I made, which is going to mean I'm going to experience the same reality again. So the only reason I got to where I got to with that investment and I realized this was because of the decisions that I made. Yeah. So I've just got to dis- change the decisions that I make from today and my future will change. So one thing that pe- people need to realize is if you're looking in the future, you'll always have anxiety. If you're looking in the past, you're always going to be slightly depressed. You'll only ever be happy when you look at the moves that you can make today. Right. And they compound. Yes. And that's just how you make it in trading. And Completely. so that allowed me to come to <coughs> solutions, figured out solutions. I was like, right. The best move I can make from here is what? Let me assess my trading. Let me look at everything that went on here from a technical point, psychological mm-hmm. standpoint, everything. And I assessed it all. So I stripped everything back and I cleaned it all again. It's like starting from square one with more experience now. Absolutely. And I say that traders have to start from square one with more experience multiple times to never get to that point again. You've got to learn how to do the right thing, uh, the wrong thing at the wrong time, enough times to do the right yeah. thing at the right time. And, and I always say, yes. Yes. And I always say this is a trait of highly successful people that every time something bad happens, yeah. every time something, a difficult situation is presented in front of yourself, that it is how re- you react. If you yeah. just cry about it and, you know, and stay in the same situation, of course, you're not going to 
end up in a better situation in the future. But if you decide to actually, of course, there's going to be a couple of days or maybe the time yeah. that it is needed to actually process it. But then after, you just need to look, as you said, you yeah. just need to look at the, be the best possible move that you can make in that particular moment. And if you do that and you move with the right intention, with the right mindset and with the right frequency, then of yeah. course you, you will end up in better situations in the future and you turn that bad situation into actually a good situation that will become yeah. the actual, actually the part of, this, of a good story. It will be the beginning of a good story. Yeah, absolutely. And also speed is very important in this, yeah. in this mm. instance. Like if you wait just two days to, right, to right, take yeah, that decision instead of two years, yeah. because some people just, yeah. you know, keep that, that problem with them and, and keep struggling. Yeah. And, and they always use it as, as an excuse. Absolutely. absolutely. Oh, yeah, it's because that time this oh, happened. I've been, oh, my yeah. family, you know, oh. <laughs> yeah. I'm a big team. I'm yeah. a big <laughs> Right. Yeah, it's, it's always like that. It's the same thing again, you know. And yeah. It gets said a lot in the entrepreneurial space, when you get knocked down, get back up. But that's stupid advice yeah. because when you get knocked down, stay down. Yeah. Re realize why you're down there in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then when you get back up, you get back up a different person and not the same fool. Yes. Headless yes. chicken yeah. making the same mistakes. You know, so there's, yeah. a, there's a lot of things out there that just get missold and missed, missed talk to traders. That if they realize, and <laughs> it makes me laugh because a lot of it's just common sense. If people just look at, I, I even did this myself. Just study old veteran traders. It's so simple. Anybody could do it. Like, have you heard of a book called Reminiscences of a Stock Operator? No, I actually no. haven't. This is a, oof, it's a very heavy trading book. Reminiscences okay. of a Stock Operator. It's by, uh, it's about a biography about Jesse Livermore. Mm -hmm. It is by far one of the best trading books I've ever read in my life because it gave me a mindset, a mindset perspective. Mm -hmm. And one thing he says in there is that instead of looking at how how, how hard it is for you now. Look at how good your story could be if you made it. Yeah, it's yeah. A perspective change. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, it's all about that. It's all about that. So you know, yeah. You know, yeah. There's a a great exercise, a practical thing. Uh, if somebody listening wants to try that, whenever bad situation, if you want to label that as bad, whatever, there is like a three step process you can follow to switch the perspective on that. Mm -hmm. And basically, the first one is accept it. Just it is what it is. I fucked up. If I fucked up, just accept that. And then the second step is like, look for the good. And the more you look for the good, the more good you will find. It's mm -hmm. just about, you know, decide, okay, I'm going to look for the good. And then the third step <clears throat> is also as important as the other two is like, forget that, forgive that, sorry. Forgive that and abandon that like completely. That's yeah. another step. I think it's important to, to not have the, the, the weight of that thing. The way, what you mentioned there is really good because they actually uh, they teach that in uh, in in Taoist philosophy, right? Which is like um, you have to visualize walking up to a tree, and imagine this tree's got multiple different branches on it, and they've got pieces of paper on. Mm -hmm. you write down that situation on a piece of paper. You okay. Pull the paper off, you scrunch it up, and you throw it away. We teach this in rewired as well. It's, uh, okay. Love that. Like Love that. Burning the paper technique. So you write down all yeah. the things you hate about yourself. Mm -hmm. Everything you hate, and then you burn it. Yeah. I, I, I heard the first time from, from Bob Proctor a similar exercise. Yeah. Because, you know, we, we can study from like 100 yeah. different mentors or authors from tens or hundreds of years ago. But at the end, I feel like everybody is saying the same thing with yeah. just a different perspective or different, different perspective. words, you different know, stories. to encapsulate thoughts yeah. or stuff like that. So it's, yeah. it's amazing to, to confront different, different perspectives on this. Yeah. yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, if I can change the topic for a yeah. while, uh, what do you think about uh, automatic trading? I mean, uh, bots, basically. So I'm not too experienced on this, but I, one of my, the friend that I mentioned used to trade for Citibank, he had a friend who traded for or worked in XTX markets, which is one of the biggest algorithmic trading firms on the planet. All right. Um, they actually supply some of the institutional banks with liquidity. They're that big. They're called XTX markets. Now, banks, apparently, from what I've been told, um, so again, this might not be fact. What I've been told from these guys is that they actually started incorporating algorithms in the early 2000s. Okay. And, uh, but mm -hmm. it became more prominent around a post-2008 crash because they wanted to make things more um, financially, uh, that's the word I'm looking for, streamlined. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing with algorithms is this, or robots. The more that robots get involved in the market or the more that they trade the market is irrelevant. It's who's moving the market. Yeah. Right? Because the majority of the market participants are human. 
So if the majority of market participants' uh, algorithms, it doesn't make a difference if they've not got the volume. They're going to do the same. If anything, they'll leave more readable price action than humans will because they're systemized. But algorithms have to be programmed by humans. Yeah. So just like a human is only, <coughs> or a calculator is only as smart as a human being that the inputs, inputs the calculation inside the calculator is. An algorithm is only as good as the trader who's actually programming the algorithm. So it's more so about the big players in the market, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, these big banks, right? That they control 85 to 87% of the daily volume on a day-to-day -day basis. The remaining percentage is small hedge funds or small investment banks and retail is 1% of that daily volume. If we know that's true, these guys we know are still using algorithms as preset limit orders at certain points in the market. Yep. We know that, that's just a fact. Not everywhere, but there's preset algorithms all over the market. Retail drive price into those areas, algorithms are triggered, and then off they go. So technically, algos are still trading the market, and it makes the market easy to trade, in my opinion, because the patterns that they leave behind are far more readable, and they have to get changed. Algorithms, and no one, and I know many people who've traded algorithms who've developed their own algorithms, um, they've actually admitted to the fact that an algorithm has to be changed periodically to adapt to market conditions. Yeah, yeah. There's only one fact that I came across that's very interesting, and my friend told me this, because he was behind the desk. He would see everybody's orders. Right. They don't see stop losses and they don't see take profits. They just mm -hmm. see buy orders and sell orders. That's all they see. Okay. He said for 10 years, he saw 26 million trades, over 18 to 20,000 traders. 26 million trades, which is not actually a lot, but over 10 years he saw that. 96% of people bought when they should have sold and sold when they should have bought. And they all obviously traded different ways, different methods. Sure. But from a human pattern and behavioral point of view, they sold at the wrong areas and they bought at the wrong areas. Ninety six percent of people. So That's he crazy. Said, we didn't have to change much. Yeah. Like from a, from their point of view, they didn't have to. They were just playing the same patterns of the market. Sure. But as investors change in the market, as interest changes and all these kind of different things, as in not financial interest, interest in trading the financial markets, these things periodically change. So I don't think algorithms are much of a detriment to us. Um, if anything, I think they're a benefit to us more than anything. Makes the market easy to trade. Yeah. Great. Do you think AI is going to change this? Same thing. AI, algorithms, uh, artificial intelligence. I mean, whatever they bring in, bring in. One thing that AI, well, I say up to debate, but one thing that it can't do yet is freedom of thought. Do right. I doubt that they will have that in the future? No, I think AI will have freedom of thought in the future, which is going to be scary. Mm -hmm. But that'll be far beyond our time. What the financial markets are going to be like then, I don't know. I mean, even if you look at them, to the financial markets today compared to 1990 and 2000, so much different. Completely. But the beautiful thing about trading a system that's dynamic is that no matter what happens to the fiat market, which I'll talk about in a second, because I've got right. a lot of information about this, what happens to the fiat yeah. market, we can trade the commodities market, we can trade the indices market, we can trade stocks, right. cryptos, bonds, anything. Um, so there's no detriment in that, in that part. But if AI does take over the market, it's, it's going to be the same thing as it's just going to replace humans that's all from our tr standpoint as a trader as a human being nothing's going to change we're still going to trade the same system but yeah. the variables behind the screen it's just going to be algos trading and not humans absolutely yeah that's that's a very interesting point so what do you think about the future of you know the fiat market the fiat currencies right <laughs> so i don't want to get you guys podcast banned right so i'll keep it uh, yeah go ahead no, no, go you, 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 you can, can go you can go whatever you can we will cut nothing. It's no problem. You said that like yeah. you want your podcast to get banned. <laughs> yeah, it's a challenge. We'll put yeah, some beep. <laughs> yeah, it's about discipline. Yeah. So we, we, we are trying to. So the year 2020 when we had the, the big medical crisis, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The C word. The reason why I believe it was all orchestrated is not because it just sounds nice to say that nowadays. I've been, I was saying this since the first time it happened in 2019. I was saying it on my Instagram. I almost got shadow banned as well. Yeah, I would say that. would crazy. I would say that everyone that thinks critically actually can kind of, yeah. you know, exactly. analyze, analyze, analyze the use, situation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And as a trader, you're looking at it probabilistically. That. <laughs> yes. You look at everything probabilistically. Yes. Right? So yeah. I was thinking, okay, I'm not going to get started in the medical system, but we'll put that aside. But now, <laughs> yeah. from an economical standpoint, we understand that oil or the petrodollar, for example, <clears> which is what they call it, the US mm -hmm. dollar is attached to a commodity, which is oil. So real debate is, is it actually a fiat currency or not? But obviously gold got lifted in 1981. The US uh, crude oil barrels are attached to the, the US dollar, right? Now, mm -hmm. we know that the correlation is simple, that the value of crude oil, as it goes up, the cost of goods and services go up in America or any US dollar based yep. economy. So what happened in 2020, they initiated a lockdown, right? 
Yeah. Now the lockdown does what? It's like house arrest, keeps people inside, they can't use cars, which means fuel is not going to get used. Which means what? There's an oversupply of oil, but now lack of demand for it. Yes. That crashed the oil market. If you guys remember in 2020, yes. the crude oil barrels, people were paying you to buy crude oil off them. Yeah. Now the, the, some brokers went negative and etc. I believe that was all orchestrated and planned to completely dissimilate the US dollar because the US dollar is the, is, the, is the world power currency at the moment. Yeah. And it's holding the fiat system. And since 1981, it's actually lost 97% of its value to date, if not more, roughly. So people can't quote me on that. Now, when the US dollar collapses, which it will anytime soon within the next five years, in my opinion, the yeah. entire fiat system is going to collapse with it. And this is why I say 2020 was planned, because if you look at debt cycles, every 50 to 75 years, there's a long term debt cycle. This is basic economics. If you fast forward from 1945, which was the Great Depression yeah. to 2020, that's exactly 75 years. 50, 75 years is a well-known stat in, economy, yeah. in economics. So 2020 that happened, they beat the dollar up dollar finishes they need to replace it with a new monetary system and it's in law that they can only replace a monetary system or change the monetary system when there's a crisis or emergency whether right. it's a world war or a pandemic yeah so anyway the pattern is the same so what happens now how is it going to get replaced now people are arguing is it going to be crypto they're actually bringing in cbdc CBC. central bank digital currencies yes which are literally coupons it's tyranny in my opinion it's crazy. If, if, your, if, if your boss says that you can't eat a certain type of food, your card's going to get declined. It's points. It's not even money. So that's or you, or that's if you're crazy. not a good citizen or whatever. Yep, your social yeah. credit score drops. Yes, yes. Right? And they, they, there's an old saying that what happens in China today is going to be the West tomorrow. China is yeah. where this first started with the yeah. CBDCs and um, social credit scores. I've got friends there that, 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 yeah. that can are I, actually seeing this now. Can yeah. I interrupt you for a second? I was in China uh, three almost four four years ago and that that's actually a long story that was actually my turning my biggest turning point in my trading career blah 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 but the whole point is i was there for two months and there were cameras everywhere like yeah. everywhere and i was with a chinese family that was showing me around and i was with them uh, and they were telling me each camera and there were they had like eight cameras in every point where you could cross the street or at Every, you know, red light or green light, eight, six, ten cameras, whatever. And they were telling me every camera is a facial recognition That's crazy. camera. And, yeah. they, and they were telling me, you know, now there's red light to cross the street. And if you actually do it, you lose some points because the camera recognizes your face and we can't do it. You can, if you want, you can go ahead. You can cross the street because there are no cars crossing. And you're Italian, so you're not Chinese. You, you don't have the social credit score so you can go ahead but we can't we, we wait for you here that was and when i realized that that was actually crazy because in the beginning they were actually explaining it in a good way they were like you know there's no criminality because people cannot you know rob someone else because they're gonna get recognized right away so it's very safe and i was like oh, okay that's actually nice and then they explained the remaining of it and that was just in disbelief it's it's sad where the, where, where that part of the world is going honestly yeah. and even even TikTok is uh, was actually yeah. generated by the Chinese Communist Party, and they've actually done it very sinisterly, in my opinion. Where in China, you're only allowed thirty minutes a day on TikTok. There's no you know graphic content on there of women yeah. or anything that demasculates men. And it's totally different. That. It's very different. And if they bring that into the West, where it's open now, mm -hmm. as much as time you want to spend on it, you can see naked women on there and all sorts. Right. Yeah, and children are being infiltrated now. Yeah. Okay where it's actually lowering, mas it's, it's decreasing masculinity in the West massively. Yes. Because if you take out the strong men in society, then the family unit is destroyed. Yeah. The family unit is destroyed, you can conquer that nation. This is old art of war tactics. And China has yeah. deployed that. And um, you know, this is what I'm, I'm personally, I'm, I'm getting out of this country in the next two years. I'm probably gonna move to Dubai or the Middle East because nice. See you the there. rules <laughs> there are so much better. Like, yeah. if you think yeah. about it, like, uh, you know, people think it's extreme. You know, you get your hand taken off if you rob a house, but no one robs a house. Right. <laughs> so it might be extreme, but it's, it never actually occurs. So it's a much safer place to live. So that's why I think that the law system is much better. Their financial system is amazing mm -hmm. from a tax point of view. And Singapore yeah. is very good. So two places yeah. I'm looking at. But uh, the West is dying now. It's not the yeah. same it used to be. Yeah, well, unfortunately, yes. Wh where are you based now? Uh, UK? Yeah, I'm based in what? the north of UK in Manchester. Okay, okay. okay. Amazing. So... So yeah, yeah I'm, uh, I'm not too far from you guys, actually. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A flight exactly. away. So uh, you think yeah. you think it's going to happen the same 
of of China in uh, Europe? I mean, in uh, um, I mean, if we categorize the West as one, I mean, like countries like Germany, countries like Sweden and Norway are so much different economically to like the UK, yeah. as an example. I don't know what it's like in Spain because uh, I've never been. But every other country that I've been, when I went to Germany, Germany was so much more sophisticated. Their law system is so much more tight, and like you won't see an overweight police officer there. But over here, almost every yeah. police officer is obese. Yeah. Like you can't stop these guys from you know helping helping stop crime. They can't even yeah. run hundred yards without getting out of breath. So whether it's gonna happen in other countries in Europe, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not too uh, too clued up on that information. But I think it's starting from America and then it's going all the way back through to the to the, to the eastern part of the world and it'll stop. Yes. You know, because China and, and Saudi and these kind of countries, they, they, they're fighting for superpower at the moment. And whoever mm -hmm. wins gets it. This is why there was a massive oil crisis and oil war. Because, that you know, the, the import and export that China has with America and then that the, the Middle East has is, is big, very, yeah. very big. But that's why the Middle East is so rich because it controls one of the most well-sought commodities on the planet, which is oil. You know, so they've got they've got America in their hands, basically. Yeah. Let's put it that way. So I don't know what's going to happen. I just want to go to Dubai and live my life there. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. We are, as as usual, we are as traders. We are analyzing the situation and, <laughs> yeah. and making the best possible move that we can make. Because we, we cannot change the situation, unfortunately. Exactly. Uh, but that actually looks like the possible situation for the future, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. yeah. we can but just take cho choices. Yeah, yeah, we just need to make the, the correct decisions to actually protect ourselves. But yeah, it was great to actually touch also these points because we actually share these views. We have some views in common about this.